welcome everybody to Charles Ferrum's fourth Brewers Roundtable. Uh, this one, Vista edition, a uh, very exciting new hop. Um, if you're here, you're probably familiar with us, but uh, just in case you're not, my name is Shane. I'm a technical sales advisor with Charles Ferrum. Uh, we were founded way back in 1865. Oddly enough, by a guy named Charles Ferrum. Uh, we are a grower owned hop merchant based in the United Kingdom. We have offices in Worcester, Yakima, Toronto, and uh, a new one in Wilkow, which is in Poland. And we use those offices to buy and sell hops uh, across the globe. We also support extensive hop breeding programs in the United Kingdom, uh, one of which is our own, and the second of which is run by uh, Y College, which is a fairly old and long-standing uh, breeding program over there. <clears throat> the Brewers Roundtable themselves are a really fun way for us to get a new or experimental hops into the hands of as many brewers as we possibly can, uh, all in one fell swoop. So it starts off with uh, a series of five collaborations with uh, a, one new hop variety. Um, and then we go and we collect beers from these different collaborations and we pack them up into sample packs along with some of the hops themselves, the raw material. And then we send those out to more brewers. Um, and then finally, we all gather here on Crowdcast to hopefully share some of the beers and share some of our experiences with the new hop. Um, this was originally designed to help launch our own proprietary varieties over here in Canada, uh, but we've recently expanded this program to include some partner varieties like NZH 101, which is from uh, the New Zealand Hops Cooperative that was featured in the last roundtable. And uh, now we're moving on to some public varieties as well. Uh, we're going to feature Vista in this one, which is really exciting. Uh, and it's just a really good way for us to integrate uh, you folks, the brewers, into um, the breeding program. Uh, you know, it puts you in the feedback loop because ultimately we want to be breeding hops that you want to be brewing with. That's how this relationship uh, is mutually beneficial to everyone. So, uh, you know, everything you say here uh, really helps us plan for the future and figure out where we're going from here. Uh, really excited about Vista when it was named uh, earlier this year. Really wanted to uh, get a little bit of exposure for it and do a roundtable that would feature it. Uh, we thought it was a fun new hop and it, it fit a niche that was missing in the public hop portfolio uh, because it had all these, you know, unique kind of tropical fruit aromatics. Um, and that was something that I, we think the public program was maybe missing a little bit. Uh, and it's something that's got a lot of traction right now. So it was a really exciting variety when it came out. Um, thankfully, someone has gone through a lot of trouble to make a brand for Vista, um, and uh, we think that's done a lot to help increase traction for the new variety, uh, and we are we're super ecstatic to have that person here with us today as a special guest. So if everybody would welcome uh, the unofficial hype man for Public Ops, uh, Mr. <laughs> Eric Sarin. <laughs> and I will move on to Eric's portion of the slideshow here. Thank you, Shane. That was quite the, quite the introduction. Yes, we have cool matching hats in case anyone's wondering. And yes, if you want some Vista merch, you can buy it at vistahops.com. And uh, all that, uh, any proceeds from that is donated to the Hop Research Council, one of the organizations that helps public hop research. So anyway, hi, I'm Eric. That's a photo of me, but the real one's right here. Um, I uh, my, my foot in hops right now is with Standard Hop Consulting, which is I do work on the side for brewers or hop sellers or hop farmers on a number of different projects, um, mostly around like how do I better use the hops I got or save money on the hops that I'm buying or that I feel like I need or working with like new product development. Um, a lot of interesting hop products coming out there, right? And almost every week there's a new, not just hop variety, but a whole new product coming out. Um, and uh, the, you know, really, I created the the kind of business to hold all this. And then we were like, Vista Hops are coming. I was like, all right, let's do something about it. Let's get Vista Hops on the map. Let's make them a nice little brand. And uh, if you're all here, you're familiar. I mean, many of you, I saw it on the cans. I love it. It's so exciting to see that little idea, that little spark. Um, credit to Pints and Pan Panels, M. Sauter, who uh, designed that logo for us. Um, really great to see that on cans and some of the colors incorporated. You know, it's so important. You know, I think we'll talk about this uh, later, but it's worth saying more than once that if a hop is released and no brewer is around to hear about it, does the hop even exist? Now, it's a rhetorical question, but I think we all imagine the answer is no. And so that's what the Vista Hop effort was all about. Like, let's make sure brewers know Vista hops exist. 
and then my uh, my uh, bona fides, if you will, I, I used to grow 80 acres of hops here in Minnesota with a farm called Mighty X Hops. And yes, I am a public hop super fan. If any of you are also public hop fans, let's connect. I love enjoying good public hops representation. So more about public hops. We got the history of public hops. Um, uh, my apologies to Dr. Henning. This is not a complete history. John Henning in the chat there is is the longest standing active U.S. public hop breeder with the USDA. So everyone say hi to John and thank you, John. John is Vista's dad. Um, maybe not biologically, but certainly uh, uh, technically, if you will. Um, so this program was started in 1904 by the United States government. It a uh, key feature of public hops is that they can be grown anywhere, sold by any farmer, any seller, anywhere. Um, so there is unlike just to just oppose it against private hops, of which is a whole slew of different ways that private hops come to market, the different ways that private hops are bred or made available to growers. Public hops are kind of defined by having the most sort of access and freedom around them. And you've all heard of these hops. <laughs> <laughs> and now you've heard of Vista, so how exciting is that? Some of the benefits of public hops for you as a brewer, um, so I guess we start with growers here. For growers is that they're free to grow. Uh, growers control their own decisions when it comes to public hops, if you want to grow them or you don't want to grow them or how many of them you want to grow or when you want to harvest them or how much you want to try to sell them for. Um, for brewers, they tend to be cheaper than the alternative. And also the flavor pro profiles can be outside kind of the private program styles. And that's... One of the things we'll talk about uh, here is that that for everyone, that genetic diversity is really crucial for addressing viruses as they come along or other disease challenges or climate change, uh, lack of water access, you know, different hot varietals will have different responses to environmental factors. And so as environmental factors change, it's important that we have a large diversity of genetic stock to be pulling from. But also, it's not just the genetic diversity that's important, but also the breeding program diversity. So if you imagine a breeding program and there's a there's an enormous amount of hop breeding going on around the world, each breeding program has its own goals, its own aims, its own style and substance, and really its own kind of flavor or fingerprint, the, the genetics that they're working with, the genetics that they've created and then are creating out of those genetics. They have their own thumbprint, their own identity. And so having a public breeding program that has its own unique sets of aims and goals and identities is critical for maintaining our diversity. And what it truly that value of diversity is at the end of the day for all of us in this industry is resiliency and sustainability. The public hot program is creating genetic stock and creating goods and creating diversity in genetics and creating products and creating new varieties that are what build a solid foundation for all of us to enjoy in this space. So public hops today, funding for the public breeding program has actually been increased in recent years, which is after a lot of work from a lot of people over a long period of time, but the, prog the program is growing. Um, they recently hired an additional uh, researcher, Dr. Kayla Altendorf, who is located at the, at the Washington Research Station, whereas Dr. Henning is at the Oregon Station. Uh, the USDA, which is the US government entity that, that is in charge of the public breeding program, also works with a number of, of private uh, interests and private organizations like the Hop Research Council, who some of you may have heard of, the Brewers Association, who many of you probably have heard of, Hop Quality Group, who you may have heard of, to support their work in developing new public hop varieties and public hop genetics. And then finally, there has been this challenge, uh, and um, we'll, you know, I've mentioned it earlier, but if <laughs> what happens if a brewer doesn't know a hop exists? Well, certainly, number one, they don't buy it. You can't buy something that you don't know exists. Um, and so working with those entities, working with the public hop program and the rest of the folks who are supporting it is really what this effort was all about, because it's not the same anymore. It's not the same as when Cascade was released or, or even when Triple Pearl was released, Dr. Henning. You know, it's a different game entirely. The revolution of the importance of marketing for the success of a hot variety or a hot product um, has significantly increased. Um, and so there is a space, the public varieties and the public program or the public varieties themselves have, have faced kind of headwinds. And in the next couple of slides, we can just go through and show sort of the declining um, uh, the unfortunate declining over 2010, you can see that these are our USA acreage. And then to today, 
And um, that's that's not necessarily good or bad. I'm not here to say that it should be 100% public or 100% private. I think as an industry, though, we can all agree that that the idea there's a balance point, and the balance point is not 10% public. So somewhere we're watching this trend. It kind of reached the tipping point in 2020, 2021, when the acreage went over 50% private, that it's a good conversation for us to be having as an industry and to be thinking about what we can do as sellers or merchants or brewers to find the right healthy balance that we think is right for our industry. Just while we're on the topic of um, of awareness, can can anybody who'd heard of Vista prior to this roundtable just drop a, a yes or a Vista in in the chat? I'm, okay, so you know we've got a handful of people out of out of the twenty or so who are in the audience uh, right now who have heard of, of Vista, which um, I think if we had asked the same question about Triumph uh, two years ago when Triumph was named. Um, we'd still be waiting for an answer. Um, so uh, thanks for for hyping it up. Um, for anybody who was at CBC, Eric was literally running around with with stickers, <laughs> just about everything to to get the good word of Vista out there. So um, that's that's very cool. All right, so I'll, I'll let you resume. Sorry to interrupt. No, no, not at all. So Vista, here we are. I'm going to take a quick photo because this is so cool. All right, put my phone away. Um, Vista, you've seen this. This is this is the brand that myself. Uh, and a few other folks here locally in Minnesota helped to create and put out there to try to give it a, a visual identity and a space uh, for all of us who are interested to get connected with it. Um, Looks great on a hat too. Amazing. <laughs> I mean, I absolutely love the colors. Um, we were trying to go for colors that were evocative of these flavors right here in front of you. Um, and you can see these are the general, these are the general flavor characteristics that we talk about when we talk about Vista. It's melon or a ripe melon, a sweet tropical, and a stone fruit, kind of white peach or white pear. Um, these are the traditional words. And it's interesting to see as beers come out with Vista, I, you know, I'm always running the Vista Instagram account and I'm seeing beers, you know, people are tagging it or hashtagging Vista hops. And I see that and I see the description. And sometimes the description looks very close to exactly the words <laughs> that are used on the website. And that's great. That's why it's there, right? We want to have some good marketing. We want to have some consistent marketing so that people can understand what it is they're experiencing uh, with this new to them hop variety. I think this is our last little slide, but I wanted to be, you know, since we're in a nerdish, we're in a relatively nerdy audience here. Um, some of the kind of going a step, a step more on, on Vista here is that one thing is interesting. Vista, now I don't have official stats because this isn't tracked, but just logically, Vista was probably or is most likely to be the most widely grown hop variety upon release in the history, or at least recent history of uh, hop production. Um, these are the states that I know this is being grown in. Of course, those first three, Washington, Oregon, and Idaho, were not a surprise to any of us. Those are the big three. But those other states, yeah, kind of cool. And, and I also know that at least in Ontario, um, Fisto is being grown. And so it's just great to see that. I think that's one of the awesome outcomes and one of the greatest impacts that the public program can, ha can have is providing, not, it's not just new and exciting uh, hop varieties for traditional growing regions. It's also new and exciting hop varieties for non-traditional growing regions. And the other thing that gets exciting for hop nerds like me is when you grow hops in different spots, they can different hops can show up with different kind of accentuations of their different characteristics. And what I've found within Vista so far, which granted this is only two harvest seasons worth of, of experience, but the Washington Vista is the Vista Vista. Uh, it's it's the one that's in this glass that I'm drinking. It's in the one that's in your glasses. It is that Vista with those three kind of categorizations as its main characteristics, but then. The Idaho Vista, which is coming from Nate Jackson's farm, Jackson Hops, um, a much stronger expression of the sweeter tropical note. Um, it was almost bubblegum like, um, which was quite interesting. And so I'm excited to see as we get harvested from these other states and as the crop continues to mature and growers learn how to interact with it and understand pick timings and growing habits and that sort of thing, what of those kind of base characteristics that we're all experiencing and that you'll share uh, that you got today, which of those end up being accentuated in different spaces and different terroirs? Awesome. Uh, okay. I uh, just add to this little bit about terroir. Uh, I shared um, 
this roundtable in on a, on a Facebook group for Niagara College, um, and somebody who was a grad there had mentioned that they'd been working with some Ontario Vista, uh, and they had worked with it side by side with some uh, American Vista, and they were they were really excited to see a continuity of the flavor profile. They did say that the Ontario grown Vista was a little bit milder; it didn't have quite the same level of intensity of uh, the American grown. Uh, versions, but it still has those distinct uh, flavor and aroma characteristics, which I think is really unique because Ontario's like, it's a cold climate for uh, hops in general. And I think if you can coax those those flavor characteristics from a hop in this cold of a climate, uh, it has a lot of growing potential. And, and Ontario, you know, we only have tiny private hop farms uh, and public varieties are extremely important to them. Um, so it, it does kind of open up some interesting space, I think. Um, uh, and yeah, I will actually read this question out. I know Eric has answered it, but uh, Max asked, uh, where does this fit into pick windows currently? Um, and uh, the response was late, um, at least in the Pacific Northwest, uh, which is great news, also seems to hang well. Um, while we were in Yakima this year, we did rub two different lots of, of Vista and it was um, two different farmers who were growing it for their, their first year. Uh, and I think that they were still dialing in pick windows and we got to see the two ends of the spectrum we did one of them was quite an early pick um and it was it was you know kind of uh, a little bit greener uh more like leaning almost floral uh and i think the other one was quite a much riper uh representation with with like the big tropical kind of density um so it, it might be interesting too to see if there is if there ends up being you know multiple sort of pick window versions of vista you know like you see commonly with maybe Amarillo or something like that, where you see an early pick Amarillo and a late pick Amarillo and brewers are using them for, for, for different uh, purposes. So I think that was kind of cool. Um, I did have one more slide tacked in here. So this is our official spec sheet for um, Vista. Um, but more importantly, this nice little spider graph here is feedback from the folks who, who actually got to assess Vista uh, for this round table. So this is all from the same lot. Um, and it's all the Vista that's in this particular, uh, or these particular beers that we're cool. sharing with everybody today. Um, yeah, citrus, stone fruit, uh, I think sweet and tropical fruit are, are kind of in there as secondary um, flavor characteristics, but yeah, it's definitely true to type. Um, I thought this was a really nice lot of, of Vista to be sharing with everybody. So we're really excited to delve into the brewers and hear what they have to say about their experiences brewing with the hop. Um, so we are going to invite them up one by one. We're going to begin with uh, Andy and Tim from Furnace Room, who are are sharing a, a camera and they're going to do some some uh, some back and forth for us, I believe. Um, we ask that if anybody in the audience has questions for um, the breweries, to please uh, either throw them in the chat or use the ask a question function while the speaker is on screen. Um, because everyone has to come up one by one, we just want to give them a chance to answer while they're still visible and audible rather than in the chat. So uh, if you could do that, that would be extremely helpful. And without further ado, uh, let's get Andy and Tim up here. Hi, guys. Um, <laughs> I don't know how uh, pertinent I'm going to be to this. Um, I am starting here next Friday. Uh, and I have not uh, brewed with uh, Vista, but I am trying their dry hopped right now. Um, yeah, very much. Uh, I'm, I'm getting the uh, stone fruit, the peach, definitely on the nose. They uh, dry hopped with it, and uh, it's very light on the uh, profile. I'd like to go a little heavier on it, maybe throw some uh, in during the uh, boil and see if I can pull more uh, flavor out of it because it is an outstanding flavor. Um, recently, I've been using um, Idaho Gem to pull a lot of... Uh, passion fruit, mango, guava flavors out of uh, some New England IPAs. And I think that I could, I could see this one going just about the same way, pulling that uh, peach flavor out of it. Awesome. So this is, uh, this is Beardmore that uh, you're talking about, just in case anybody missed that one. Um, and this is uh, a regular production beer for a furnace room. Um, but this is a sort of one-off version that's been dry hop with Vista instead of the usual hop regime. Um, would you care to comment or do you have uh, an opinion on sort of where it stands in compared to uh, the sort of original Beardmore or uh, Andy perhaps? Okay, here yeah, we go. So it's been a little while. It's been over, 
think it's been about a year since we did a, a the previous beer more dry hop and uh, so my recollection Get may be a little in. my <laughs> recollection may be a little muddy but uh, what I find is is it's this seems to be a little smoother but it still has a like a crisp a crisp kind of finish at the end so that's my taste reflections on it and the sweetness is coming out nice and the sweetness well. is coming out nicely awesome thank you very much I thought, I thought the beer was really nice. I uh, I did have a chance to enjoy them all earlier. I'm I'm still recovering from a little bit of a cold, so I'm going to refrain from any of them today. But uh, I thought that it, it lended a little bit of complexity to the Kolsch, which can, which can be you know a nice sort of malt-driven style, um, and you know it, it often has a, a touch of hop nuance to it. Um, so it was interesting to see more of a modern spin on that with the uh, the Pacific Northwest hop rather than like a you know more classic uh, you know hint of you know fruit or perla or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it, it melded really well. Yeah, agreed. Well, our, our beer more sells very, very well uh, as a as a lager ale, uh, and uh, this gives it that extra little dimension. So we're quite happy with the way things turned out. Yeah, I like it a lot. Perfect. Thank you very much for your time, gentlemen. Uh, up next, we're going to hear from Aiden at Waterloo. All right. Hello, sir. How's it going? It is going very well on yourself. Fantastic. Awesome. Yeah, so uh, this is Further Sky. It's uh, pretty cool that I was invited to uh, do this round table with you folks because I don't generally package any uh, beers aside from in kegs. So um, when Shane reached out about this opportunity, it was uh, a fun way to uh, put a couple bottles together and get beers outside of these walls, which doesn't typically happen um, for the beers that I brew, at least. <laughs> you have to bring in some some homebrew equipment to, to do some bottling or do they have yeah. some facility for you at the brewery? Yeah, I uh, reached out to an old brewery I worked for and knew they had a pallet of uh, bottles around, so collected some of those and- um, Made the magic happen. Yeah. yeah. So, um, yeah, Rebecca joined me on the uh, brew day for this beer. Um, and Saisons are just like a style that I really love. So I was uh, excited to be able to brew this one. Um, the whole, like every hop edition was with uh, Vista. So um, a little bit in the kettle, uh, lots at Whirlpool, and then um, the rest of it just being a pretty hefty dry hop. So um, really focusing on like some nice foam positivity too, um, pouring it on tap and get like a beautiful whip on there, which I think is just like one of the joys of Saison. So I find the, the uh, not like stone fruit peach really comes through and uh, lends well to like the minerality of Saison. Like um, it just kind of like, you can't tell where pop begins in the like, it pairs well with the yeast, I guess is what I'm trying to say. Um, like you can really, they just like they blend just like together one. nicely as one. Yeah, the, the, it's hard to, hard to say, hard to say where the ester profile ends and the hot profile begins. Totally. Like, uh, the nice bits, yeah. You used uh, a couple different uh, different adjuncts in there too. Is that something you're you're often using uh, like multi-grain for Saison? It's, it kind of looked like a everything bagel when you sent me the- Yeah, I think it's, uh... I don't know. I think it's easy for people to kind of go into that. Like I've worked places where they use like Vienna and really make your Saison like a, a nice ambery nice looking ambery. thing. Um, I really like to just like think about what would be on a farm and kind of lean into that. So um, use some wheat, uh, rye, um, a little bit of flaked corn. Um, and it's just kind of like a, a good combination to me. Um, makes it where like it is light and refreshing and you can have several pints of it. Yeah, the drinkability is is pretty high on that one. <laughs> so job, job well done. Thank you. <laughs> awesome. That's that, what Saison strand you were using? Um, I believe it was uh, Escarbon Lab's Old World Saison. Um, I reached out to my friends at Block 3 and was like, hey, I know you guys got some Saison yeast and uh, Kevin and James were happy to help me out on that. So um, I believe that's what the strain is, but not entirely sure. Perfect. 
kind of love the the craft brewing community. You know, Aiden, uh, <laughs> thank you able to participate through the assistance from from a few other folks. And uh, I mean, we love the the support that people get. It's really awesome to hear about that. So perfect, yeah, thank Aiden. You. Thank you very much for your time and your beer. Um, thank you. Much appreciated, and uh, we'll make way for the next guest. Thank you very much. Awesome. All right. Up next, we have the folks from Willibald. I'm Tyler. I'm the sales manager at Willibald. Joe wasn't able to make it, so I'm just going to kind of jump in. So don't mind me. So we, uh, we've got new Vistas here. So kind of wanted to play off the name, obviously, Vista. We ended up doing a dry hot Pilsner, which um, I kind of find it drinks more like a pale ale. Like I, I don't get a lot of the lager characteristics from this, um, which I mean, I'm, I'm fine with, like, I love kind of more pale ales too, but, um, it's really nice, really clean, still pretty, uh, bready. I think you do get like a little bit of sulfur as well, but you would kind of get like a, a traditional pills. Um, but super, super refreshing. Um, yeah. And, uh, I know Joe mentioned he actually loved working with Vista and uh kind of wants to do something else with like a pale ale or an ipa and just really uh go a bit more crazy with it as well um but yeah cheers cheers thanks tyler um the one thing i did notice about this beer and i, I had to, mm -hmm. tried to have them sort of i try to get them side by side so i can have a sort of contrast between them all and i think that mm -hmm. i got the most uh the most sort of representation of the pear aroma in this beer, I think, out of out of all of them. Like, I feel like that flavor note really jumped. Um, I don't know if anybody else is finding that. Maybe it's just my palate, but um, I did get that sort of distinct, like, candied pear. You know, when you get one that's, like, really ripe, and it just, like, mm -hmm. sort of melts in your mouth. Like, I kind of got that characteristic on this beer. I thought it was really nice. Like, it was a cool space for a lager. Um, you know, maybe it's because there's, there's not really... Uh, a lot of competition from the malt or from from other factors, and so it's able to kind of kind of really showcase the hop uh, or or something to do with the, the combination of the lager yeast. But uh, yeah, Ryan suggesting maybe colder addition temperature. That's a good mm -hmm. uh, a good observation as well. Um, but yeah, it definitely definitely I think it's a different sort of um, representation of this uh, compared to the other beers. Yeah, and I know, I think Joe really wanted to do that as well, just keep it really, you know, just let the hops kind of speak. Like, I know he, like, nothing crazy malt-wise, just looking at his notes, uh, you know, pills, acidulated, um, but really just letting the hop kind of lead. Uh, yeah, so I, yeah, yeah I just saw that question. Um, yeah, so we, uh, we used the hop through the boil, and then we also did a dry hop with it. Which is kind of nice. I I can kind of see with a dry hop, like not getting a ton of bitterness, just like a little bit, and then, uh, but yeah, definitely getting the pear aroma as well. Um, a little bit of tropical as well, but it, it is nice. Like I think it does work well in the style. Perfect. Awesome. It's uh, up next, Ryan from Mill Street. Hey everybody, I'm Ryan McDonald. Hey. Brewer at uh, Mill Street Brewery. Uh, so I'm going to talk about our Vista Hop APA today. Uh, I wanted to call it A La Vista or Insight IPA or APA, but uh, we keep our names pretty generic at the brewery. Uh, so just poured this and the inspiration of this one was uh, your classic Sierra Nevada pale ale. So keeping it pretty clean and not too complex as far as the malt bill goes, we used uh, two row wheat and some cara wheat. Uh, only about 2.5% cara wheat to give it that nice uh, edging on amber color. Uh, the uh, hop profile for this beer was all Vista. So I did a first wort edition. Uh, I did a Whirlpool edition as my wort was moving from kettle to Whirlpool, so very hot edition. Uh, then we recirculated the Whirlpool back to itself through the heat exchanger, chilled down below 80 C, uh, added hops again for a second Whirlpool edition. Uh, and then we also dry hopped. So. I was really trying to get as much uh, aromatic quality as well as the flavor profile as I could out of this hop uh, without pulling too much bitterness. Uh, so it came in at uh, 27 BU. We declared it 30 because we like to round up. 5.6% uh, ABV. And uh, I really, really love how the hops uh, hops worked in this beer. Uh, I keep getting apricot, but maybe that's just me fancying up peach. Um, 
but yeah, tons of stone fruit, uh, a little bit of tropical characteristics. I pulled a little bit of citrus, a little bit like a, an orangey character. And then like somewhere in the background, I can almost get mango. But again, that's maybe me looking a little too deep into it. Uh, but yeah, I loved working with this hop. Was uh, was really happy with the final product. Uh, the only other thing that was my secret weapon in this beer is I did add a little bit of table salt. Uh, not as much as you'd find in a Goza, but just that little hint of table salt. And I find that addition in some pale ales and some IPAs can actually help accentuate the fruit character that you pull from hops. Um, so yeah, I, I really loved Vista. And uh, just this week, I brewed a peach clementine uh, IPA that I'm going to use Vista and Citra in. So should be good. Nice. Awesome. Glad to hear it's, it's found a couple homes over at, uh, over at Mill Street there. It's cool when, uh, when brewers have good experiences first time around and they're excited to get it into something else. So it, uh, it seems like, uh, yeah, this to hit all the, the spots for you. Awesome. Um, yeah, you did touch a little bit on the, the cool pooling, the, the dual whirlpool. I'd be really curious to see what this beer would like would be like in a side by side where just a hot whirlpool and then the hot and cold whirlpool, uh, both from a, you know, a, a, a sort of technique standpoint and from a what does Vista do when you do this? What does Vista do when you do that kind of standpoint? Um, that'd be uh, that'd be pretty neat to see. But uh, yeah, it's awesome to, to always hear about people doing, you know, different little techniques and stuff like that to, to help you know, whatever your brew house will let you get away with, I guess, uh, to, to help improve on the, uh, yeah, an already good thing, I guess. <clears throat> yeah. And if your brew house won't let you cool pool, just cast out onto the hops and dry hop again. Yeah. That's a, that's a good, uh, a good thought too. Awesome. Uh, thank you very much, Ryan. Much appreciated. Tasty beer. Uh, we'll get up the next guest. Thanks very much. I have James from Burdock Brewery and the perpetual search for orange juice. Thanks, Shane. Hi, I'm James Turco. I'm the production manager here at Burdock. Um, this beer that we brewed is called Nula. It's one of our core beers. I guess I'm allowed to say core. Yeah, core beer. We always brew it. Um, and it's just a dry hop sour. And um, when we got the sample from Charles Farum and we kind of rubbed it, we got a real Clementine vibe. That kind of struck us more than anything and the goal of this beer is to try to be orange juice or to be reminiscent of orange juice and so uh, just pretty heavy dry hop pretty pale um, it's 100 percent uh, vireman pale ale malt um, the way our process works we don't put any hops in the kettle we cast out hot 40c into a tank and then we lacto it by itself in tank and then after about 24 hours, we crash it to ale pitching temps and do a two-part dry hop. Um, the first part on day one, and then the second part um, in a week. And this is dry hop to about one kilogram a heck, um, and it's two to one Vista to El Dorado. Um, normally, it would be a blend of three different hops, um, but we found that the Vista, Vista kind of replaced Citra in this, um, which is kind of cool. Um, and this Eldorado that we have uh, from Crop Year 21 is really nice, and they play really well together. And so um, we really like kind of the end result on that dry hop. Um, and so, yeah, just um, tart, not super sour. Um, and I think the, like, citrus vibes from the Vista really carry nicely in this. So, yeah. This, this awesome. was the beer that was, like, I, I you know, Thanks to Charles Farrow for shipping them all. I got to try all these beers. This one was like, wow. Like to me, it was really pulling that great Vista kind of fruit, stone fruit, whatever fruit you get out of it. I don't want to be too descriptive, just like into the sour environment where it was delivering that fruit expression without literally fruit being in there, which, you know, when you start adding actual fruit to sours, you can run into challenges maintaining, you know, that sour integrity, if you will. So I've really enjoyed this one. Thank you. Yeah, we have done fruited variants of Nula, but typically when we do that, we drop the dry hop pretty hard. Um, so you don't kind of get a clash there. Um, but I like this more. I mean, you know, uh, the fruit is kind of for people that love fruit. Um, but this yeah. to me is more of like a clear beery kind of beer. Yeah, fruit from hops, fruit flavor from hops is, is yeah. a very different experience. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, I definitely got some like uh, the like San Pellegrino blood orange, you know, beverage things you buy. Like it, it was giving off that, that vibe, which I thought was really, really nice. It's a fun, fun place to be in. Um, 
one of the things that you spoke about um, a little bit when we were we were brewing was that uh, you you do kind of take this approach to recipes where you just sort of sub in and out hops um, as you see yeah. fit, and there's no kind of fit uh, set regimen to it. Did you want to speak a little bit about that? I, I do hear brewers kind of taking this approach. Um, I think yeah. it's pretty unique. Lately, we've been on some pretty big hop contracts, and so this isn't as true now, but in the past where things were more spot, you know, you get some citra, and you're like, okay, is this citra? And you rub it, and maybe it's less less bright or less tropical or whatever, and so we're always kind of trying to rotate in the hops that are giving us the best aroma profile when we rub, and that, you know, we've had some bad everything, you know, Um, and so rather than tying the hop brand of the dry hop for any beer we make we do kind of mix and match and sometimes things fit together better we don't really single dry hop anything um and that's just to try to get you know we're looking for a profile in the finished beer and there are a lot of ways to get there and it isn't necessarily tied to a single hop or you know what and and because hops are so different you know so i think it's just about like blending to hit a profile uh not necessarily saying well this is a citra beer and we just use a lot of citra um and so vista you know as we were rubbing it and feeling it we're like man this is like this is a nula hop like this fits in with nula so well as opposed to an ipa or a pale ale or something like that yeah i think you had you had initially initially said something about amarillo on on steroids um which yeah. i thought was a pretty cool yeah. thing. good um, good amarillo yeah. thank you very much james enjoyed the nula much appreciated. Uh, talk soon. Awesome. I will share our contact details with everybody. Hopefully, uh, if anybody has any further questions for Eric or for myself, you can please feel free to reach out to us at these email addresses. Uh, we love to talk cops so much. We made a living out of it. Um, so yeah, you are, uh, you're more than welcome. Um, a sneak peek into the next round table. Uh, we are venturing back into proprietary land. Um, we have uh, a unique opportunity. We partnered with, uh, hops direct a while ago. And so they are growing some of our varieties in the U S uh, so the next round table will feature uh, a British hop that's being grown in the U S. So it's a really, really unique, uh, take on things. I think uh, we had a chance to assess these varieties while we were over there uh, earlier this year, and I was really, really impressed with how different they were from what we've been growing in the UK. So I think it'll be a fun spot. Uh, if you are interested in brewing a beer for the upcoming roundtable, uh, give me a shout. It'll be spring sometime. Uh, either drop your contact details in the chat here or send me an email, whatever you like. Uh, we're always looking for new breweries to participate and uh, form some opinions and and tell us about what they're up to and uh, how these hops fit into their their everyday brewing regime. Uh, Eric, did you have anything you wanted to add? I'll just say thanks, everybody. Thanks for brewing the beers. Thanks for exploring Vista with us. With these public hops, it, it really is. It takes, it takes all of us. We all have a role to play in understanding and learning about new props, new public hops in the drop and, and sharing about the story of public hops and then sharing our what we're learning about how the hop is used. You know, this was so valuable. I took a lot of notes when y'all were talking about how your experience with Vista went. You know, it'll be it'll be a year, two years of additional harvest and additional brewing before, you know, we can all kind of get a nice collective image of exactly, you know, where Vista plays or fits well or doesn't as much. Um, and I love learning all of this. Um, it's definitely a part of the public hop experience is this collaborative, everyone is welcome, sharing is caring uh, sort of game. And I love that about it. So thank you all for being a part of that. Awesome. And thanks again, uh, a special guest number one, Eric, for being here and backing me up and, and doing the, the line share of the speaking so I can rest my vocal cords. Also, special thanks to uh, Dr. John Henning, who uh, appeared in the audience. Um, really appreciate you coming out uh really excited about vista i think a lot of the folks who are here uh are excited about vista too so um yeah really really cool of you to join us um huge huge pat on the back hypothetical one uh from from all of us here thanks for for developing a really fun hop all right everybody thank you very much we're out hope to see you again soon cheers